5.3, evaluating trigonometric functions. Now, what we're going to do here is we're going to actually work our way backward a little bit. We used some of this previously, but now we're going to focus a little more effort on it. So, when we were dealing with trigonometric functions and the terminal side of an angle, we used SOHCAHTOA to determine what those ratios were going to be. So we're going to come back and use SOHCAHTOA again. and put it together for use with an actual triangle. So I'm going to give us a right triangle with angles A, B, and C, and I'm going to give sides opposite being A, B, and C. And we're going to use this to come up with our trigonometric ratios. First of all, sine of A, so we're going to use A as the angle that we're dealing with, is equal to opposite over the hypotenuse, Sokotoa, which in this case, opposite over the hypotenuse would be A over C. Cosine of A is adjacent over hypotenuse, adjacent over hypotenuse, which is B over C. Tangent A, opposite over adjacent, so A over B. Cotangent A, adjacent over opposite, which is B over A. Secant A is hypotenuse over adjacent, so C over B. And then cosecant A is equal to hypotenuse over opposite, which is C over A. So that's looking at this triangle. Now what I'm going to do now is point something out that gets a little interesting. Well, what if I deal with sine, cosine, tangent, cotangent, cosecant, and secant of angle B? What is that going to be? Okay, sine of angle B is opposite over hypotenuse. That's B over C. Cosine of angle B is adjacent over hypotenuse, A over C. Tangent of angle B is opposite over adjacent, so B over A. Cotangent is adjacent over opposite, A over B. Secant is hypotenuse over adjacent, hypotenuse over adjacent, so C over A. And cosecant is hypotenuse over opposite. Which is going to be C over B. Cosecant B. And we see here that each trigonometric function of angle A has an associated trigonometric function of angle B. And we call these cofunctions. So sine of A is the cofunction of cosine of B. Cosine of A is the cofunction of sine of B. 
So sine and cosine of the two acute angles in a right triangle are co-functions. Which means that we can write a trigonometric function of one angle as a trigonometric function of the other angle. So if I have the sine of 9 degrees, I can write that as cosine of some angle. But now comes the question, of what angle? Well, of this other angle. So let's go back to basic knowledge of triangles. The sum of the interior angles of a triangle is 180 degrees. In a right triangle, the angle opposite the hypotenuse is 90 degrees, which means that the other two angles add up to 90 degrees or they are complementary. So that means that the co-functions are going to be dealing with angles that are complementary. So sine of 90 degrees is equal to cosine of 90 minus 9 or 81 degrees. Tangent of 42 degrees is equal to cotangent of 90 minus 42 or 48 degrees, etc. So we can write trigonometric function of one of the angles as the co-function or co-trigonometric function of the other angle, which we can find at times will be quite helpful and make our lives a little bit easier. Actually, I think I want to leave that in place there. Actually, I don't at this point, so that's good. So, now what I want to look at are some, well, some special angles that we deal with regularly. We've looked at quadrantal angles, 90, 0 degrees, 90 degrees, 180 degrees, 270 degrees, and 360 degrees, and then obviously any coterminal angles with those. But what I'm going to look at now are what we consider to be some of the standard angles. And those are 30 degrees, 45 degrees, and 60 degrees. So those are standard angles that we deal with on a regular basis. And they're ones that many instructors expect you to know off the top of your head the trig functions for these. So they expect you to know sine theta, cosine theta, tangent theta, cotangent theta, secant theta, and cosecant theta for all of these angles. And we may look at that and go, oh boy, isn't that going to be fun? In fact, they don't just want you to know the values, they want you to know the exact values. So I'm going to show you a very, what I consider a simple way to come up with all these values. Now, once we have built this table, if you can remember these and memorize them all, that's fine. For me, that's not a quick, easy thing to do. Not good at memorizing those things. But I can build it whenever I want and come up with the values. And here's how I do it. I deal with two triangles. One triangle, let me grab a marker and put that on this paper. They're both right triangles. One triangle has a 60 degree angle and a 30 degree angle. And this triangle is as easy as 1, 2, the square root of 3. 
1 squared plus the square root of 3 squared. 1 squared is 1. Square root of 3 squared is 3. 1 plus 3 is 4. Square root of 4 is 2. Okay. And this builds our triangle with 60 degrees and 30 degrees in it, which will allow us to get all these functions for a 30 degree angle and a 60 degree angle. The other triangle that I'm going to build Again, a right triangle, 45 degrees and 45 degrees. Well, one thing that you may remember about triangles is that if the angles are the same, then the sides opposite have the same length. And if you have a larger angle, then the side opposite is going to be large. So the largest angle in the triangle has the side opposite being the longest. The smallest angle in the triangle has the smallest side opposite. So looking at this, we can say, well, wait a second. So this side and that side are opposite the same angle, 45 degrees. Therefore, they must be the same length. So I'm going to use 1 because one's easy. 1 squared is 1 plus 1 squared, 1. So 1 plus 1 is 2. So the hypotenuse must be the square root of 2. Now that I've built these two triangles, I can put together this whole setup here. Sine of 30 degrees, so up here, opposite over hypotenuse, one half. Sine of 45 degrees, opposite over hypotenuse, one over the square root of two, or square root of two over two when we rationalize the denominator. And they would want to see you do it as the square root of two over two. Sine of 60 degrees, opposite, square root of 3 over 2. Now, remember, cos cosine is the co-function of sine. So if the sine of 30 degrees is 1 half, then the cosine of 60 degrees is 1 half. And if you don't remember that it's the co-function, you can just go, well, the cosine of 60 degrees is adjacent over hypotenuse, one half. But that also means that if the sine of 60 degrees is the square root of 3 over 2, then the cosine of, 60 of 30 degrees is going to be the square root of 3 over 2. And if sine and cosine, are, if, sine, if the angle is 45 degrees, the other angle is 45 degrees, so the sine of 45 degrees is square root of 2, as is the cosine of 45 degrees. Okay, so that got those taken care of. But what about tangent? Tangent is opposite over adjacent. So tangent of 30 degrees, opposite 1 over adjacent, square root of 3, 1 over square root of 3, which gives us the square root of 3 over 3. Tangent of 45 degrees, opposite over adjacent, 1. Tangent of 60 degrees, opposite over adjacent, square root of 3 over 1, or square root of 3. Cotangent is the cofunction of tangent. So if the tangent of 30 degrees is the square root of 3 over 3, then the cotangent of 60 degrees is the square root of 3 over 3. And vice versa, if the tangent of 60 degrees is the square root of 3, then the cotangent of 30 degrees must be the square root of 3. And if the tangent of 45 degrees is 1, then cotangent of 45 degrees is 1. Leaving us with secant and cosecant. Remember, secant and cosecant are reciprocals of cosine and sine, respectively. So if cosine is square root of 3 over 2, then secant must be 2 over square root of 3, or 2 square root of 3 over 3. If secant, I'm sorry, if cosine of theta is of 45 degrees is square root of 2 over 2, then secant must be 2 over the square root of 2, 
or 2 square root of 2 over 2, which comes back to the square root of 2. Because remember, that was 1 over the square root of 2. It's the square root of 2. And if cosine of 60 degrees is 1 half, then secant of 60 degrees must be 2 over 1, or 2. Cosecant, if the sine of 30 degrees is 1 half, then the cosecant must be 2. And remember that secant and cosecant are reciprocal functions. So this will be the square root of 2, and this will be... 2 radical 3 over 3. And so we have filled in all the values of this table. Now, without using cofunctions, we could have just as easily pulled them off of these, but I think the cofunctions allowed us to switch it around a little bit without using as much thought. Also, the reciprocal functions allowed us to do that. So just remember. 30 degree and 60 degree angles are as easy as 1, 2, square root of 3. 1, 2, square root of 3. This, can't, this has to be square root because if it was just 1, 2, 3, this would be longer than the hypotenuse. So that can happen. So just remember, 1, 2, square root of 3. And remember that the square root of 3 is longer than 1, so 60 degrees must be opposite the square root of 3. And 30 degrees must be opposite 1. And then for 45 degree angles, the sides are the same, so just make it easy, 1 and 1, which gives you the square root of 2. And we're able to build this whole table. So that's not too bad. We can do it from building two triangles. Or, if you're a glutton for punishment, feel free to memorize this whole table. Now that you have the table memorized, let's make use of it. And I really shouldn't say if you're a glutton for punishment, because many people can memorize this table without any problem. And as you use it more and more, it just becomes easier to recall. For me, it's always been a difficulty just remembering things like that. But I can remember how to construct it, so that's where I build my triangles. So now I want to talk about reference angles. A reference angle is an acute angle, meaning that it is between 0 and 90 degrees, and it refers whatever angle we're dealing with to the x-axis. So right here, I'm showing an example where we have a reference angle of 30 degrees. And so this angle here, the terminal side is 30 degrees away from the x-axis, and we would call that a 30 degree angle in standard position. So I'm just gonna put that here, 30 degrees. This angle, is a 30, makes a 30 degree angle, or this terminal side makes a 30 degree angle in relation to the x-axis but as an angle in standard form that is 150 degrees. How do I know it's 150 degrees? Because I know that this is 180 minus 30 is 150. This angle here, this terminal side in relation to the x-axis is 30 degrees. Let 
but in standard position, it's 180 plus 30, or 210 degrees. And then this final terminal side in relation to the x-axis is 30 degrees. But in standard, form here, it's actually 330 degrees because we have 360 would be all the way, minus 30 gives you 330 degrees. Now, why do we care about these reference angles? Well, there, may, there are a couple reasons why we may care about these, one of which we're going to deal, actually there's numerous reasons, but one of the reasons we're going to deal with when we get into law of signs dealing with oblique triangles. So I'm going to leave that for future. But we can also use this because our calculators can do many things, but they don't know everything. And we run into a problem when we're dealing with our calculators. If I take the sine of 30 degrees, and I take the sine of 150 degrees, well, we know that the sine of 30 degrees was one half, if I remember correctly, from our little table here. Just to verify that, like I said, those, those are horrible for me. So, sine of one half, just as I thought. Never hurts to verify something with your calculator. Okay, so that's one half. Well, if I take the sine of 150 degrees, I also get one half. Now, that doesn't seem like a problem until I ask the question, what's the inverse sine of one half? Well, if I plug that in, into my calculator, it tells me it's 30 degrees. Is that correct? Ooh, good question. Well, if I have this, it's going to be 30 degrees, right? That's going to have a sine of one half because we're going to, in the first quadrant, sine is positive, but also in the second quadrant, sine is positive. So our calculators can't differentiate between different quadrants, unless there's a negative sign, S-I-G-N, then it can differentiate somewhat, but remember, for each of the trig functions, there are two quadrants in which it's positive and two quadrants in which it's negative. So reference angles will allow us to determine the value or I should say, we can get the reference angle from the calculator, and then we can use other information, such as which quadrant it's in, to give us the actual angle. Excuse me. <coughs> Sorry. Sorry about the echo there. So we can use these reference angles to deal with the fact that the signs, as I G N S, are the same in more than one quadrant. So in quadrant one, the real angle is going to be equal to the reference angle. In quadrant two, the real angle going to be equal to 180 degrees minus the reference angle. 
in quadrant three, the real angle, I just want to put Qs there, is going to be equal to 180 degrees plus the reference angle. And in quadrant four, the real angle is going to be equal to 360 degrees minus the reference angle. So we can use those to work our way through. So we're going to put this together and say, okay, if we have non-quadrantal angles, and we want to find their values, first thing we're going to do is if theta is less than zero or greater than 360, we're going to find the least positive coterminal angle. So least positive coterminal angle. If it's negative or if it is above 360 degrees. Find the least positive coterminal angle. Then we're going to find the reference angle. We're then going to find the function values for the reference angle. And then we're going to use our knowledge of the quadrants and signs, SIGNS, to determine the correct side of the value. So let's look at that. What if I want to find the sine of negative 150 degrees? Now, yes, you may say, hey, I can use my calculator. Well, what I'm looking for are, are exact values. Remember that radical 3 over 3, radical 2 over 2, radical 3, 1 half. Those are all exact values. They're not the approximations that we get from our calculator. So I want to find the sine of 150 degrees. Well, 150 degrees, neg sorry, negative 150 degrees, that's a negative number. I want to make it the least positive coterminal angle that I can. So if you remember, if we have negative, we're just going to add 360. So negative 150 degrees plus 360 degrees gives us positive 210 degrees. 210 degrees is in the third quadrant. Right, third quadrant is from 180 to 270. So if that's in the third quadrant, then our reference angle is going to be this angle, 210 degrees, minus 180 degrees, which is going to give us 30 degrees. So that is going to be our reference angle, 30 degrees. Well, so we now want to find the sine of 30 degrees. Well, we know what the sine of 30 degrees. The sine of 30 degrees is equal to 1 half. Now we know we're in quadrant 3. In quadrant 3, sine is negative. So we can take negative sine of 30 degrees, which gives us negative 1 half. And if you plug that into your calculator, sine of negative 150 degrees, you're going to find out that it is negative 1 half. So that allows us to use our standard angles, 30, 45, and 60 degrees, to find the trigonometric ratios for a number of different angles, as long as they have the reference angle that we can that gives us an exact value. So let's get this out of the way. I have to fight this red on the board. It likes to stick around a little longer than I wanted to. Okay, so looking at that. Let's continue on and do a little something with using our calculator. Because now we've dealt with our standard angles, 30, 45, and 
and 60. We've dealt with our quadrantal angles, 0, 90, 180, 270, 360. It's time to deal with other angles. And how do we calculate that? Well, some of them are really easy to calculate. First of all, I want to get rid of this red marker so it's not staining my board. Well, for many of them, we can just plug it into the calculator. Cosine of 193.622 degrees. Well, any scientific calculator has the cosine function, so as long as we're in degrees and we plug that in, we get negative 0 0.97 like maybe 1, 8. I'm going to just plug that into my calculator again because I can't read my writing. So we got 193.622. We're going to take the cosine of that. So it was a 1. So we go negative 0 0.97187064084 approximately. And of course, we would round that at some point, but that's as much as my calculator gave me. But what if I have amassed the cosecant of 35.8471 degrees? Well, my calculator doesn't have the cosecant function. Yours may, or it may not, depending on the type of calculator you're using. So how can I deal with the cosecant function? Well, remember the cosecant function is the reciprocal function of sine. So that's equal to 1 over sine of 35.8471 degrees. So if I plug that into my calculator, and I go 35.8471, Eight four seven one, and I take the sine of that, and then I take the reciprocal of that, I get 1.707579671288. And if you have a calculator that does cosecant, plug that in and you'll see that it comes out the same. So I can use the fact that it has a reciprocal function to find it. What about secant of negative 287 degrees? Well, I can do the same thing. Secant is the reciprocal of cosine. So 1 over the cosine of negative 287 degrees. 287 cosine gives me 0 0.292371704723. Take the reciprocal of it, and I get 3.420303619833. So using our reciprocal functions to find these. Now, that was relatively easy going this direction. What if we use our inverse functions? How does that affect things? So what if I'm given that the cosine of theta is equal to 0 0.921185.41? Well, cosine of theta is equal to that. That's the ratio. I want to find theta. Well, theta is equal to the inverse cosine of 0 0.921185.41. And my calculator has an inverse cosine function. So that's going to be equal to, so I'm going to plug it in, 0.921185.41. And I take the arc cosine or the inverse cosine, and I get approximately, well, I get approximately 22.8. 
9999. So I'm going to put a repeating on there. And I realize if you plug this value into your calculator, it actually repeats a number of times and it goes to 3741. I, 3471. I just didn't want to write that. So we're just going to say it's approximately this. Otherwise, I'd have to round it to 0.9 here because everything, I've got a number of nines afterwards. Degrees. So not bad if I'm dealing with cosine. But what if I'm dealing with cotangent? The cotangent of theta is equal to 1.4466474. Well, then I know that theta is equal to the inverse cotangent of 1.4466474. But how do I deal with that here? Well, I know that cotangent and tangent are reciprocal functions. So that means that my ratio is going to get flipped to go to the other one. So I can say that theta is equal to the inverse tangent of 1 over 1.4466474. Right? Cotangent and tangent are reciprocal functions, which means the ratio gets flipped when I switch to the other one. So that's what I did. I went from 1.4466474 over 1 to 1 over 1.4466474. Don't make the mistake of taking the inverse tangent of 1.444, whatever, and uh, putting that, then taking the reciprocal of it. Take the reciprocal first, then do the inverse tangent. So I have 1.4466474. I take the reciprocal of that, and then I take the inverse tangent of that, or the arctangent of that, as my calculator calls it. And I get theta is equal to 34.6543, etc. degrees. So that's what we get from that. So we can go from, or we, we can go from an angle and take the trigonometric function of an angle and get the ratio, approximate ratio using our calculator, or we can start with the ratio and find the angle for that trigonometric function, and again, the approximate angle. The only times we really get the exact values are when we're dealing with those quadrantal angles or our standard ones, 30, 45, and 60, because those we know where to get them from. Anything else, it's not as pretty. So the last thing I want to cover is how to find all, met, all values of theta if theta is in a certain interval and we are given one of the trig functions. In this case, we're going to look at the interval from 0 degrees to 360 degrees and we know that sine of theta is equal to negative square root of 3 over 2. Okay, I'm going to get, make that look more like an n instead of an h. So sine of theta is equal to negative square root of 3 over 2. First of all, okay, so this is giving us the full circle, but we're not including 360 degrees. So we're covering all four quadrants. Sine of theta is negative square root of 3 over 2. So in what quadrants is the sine of theta negative? Sine of theta is negative in the third and fourth quadrants. So this is in quadrant 3 and quadrant 4. And we're going from 0 to 360, so we're looking for 3 or 4 positive angles. So now, if it's negative there, we know that square root of 3 over 2 is the, so if, if we're dealing with the reference angle, 
that we're going to get the square root of 3 over 2. So we want to know when is sine of theta equal to the square root of 3 over 2. Now, if we look back to our ratios, or we can even look at it here, we can build our triangle quickly and go, okay, well, we got a right angle there, we got 60 degrees, 30 degrees, 1, 2, square root of 3, sine is opposite over hypotenuse, opposite over hypotenuse, so that must be 60 degrees. So if theta is equal to 60 degrees, that's when we're going to have the square root of 3 over 2. But we want it to be negative, which means we're in the third and fourth quadrants. In the third quadrant, we're going to take 180 degrees and add 60 degrees. So 180 degrees plus 60 degrees gives me 240 degrees. And then in the fourth quadrant, we're going to take 360 degrees and subtract 60 degrees, which gives me 300 degrees. So when is sine of theta equal to negative square root of 3 over 2? When in the interval from 0 to 360 degrees. When theta is equal to 240 degrees and 300 degrees degrees. So a lot of things we can do as long as we understand these relationships. And yes, I agree, that's a number of relationships and a lot of things going on. So I would suggest looking it over and trying it again, verifying that you understand how these different relationships work. The most common mistakes that I see are when we're dealing with reciprocal functions and the inverse functions of those. Inverse function of cose the inverse of cosecant, the inverse of secant, the inverse of cotangent, because we tend to flip the wrong thing. But that finishes off evaluating trigonometric functions.